we're lucky to have with us today Travis Tiger, who's uh, Chief Executive Officer of the United States Anti-Doping Agency. And he's a UNC grad, philosophy major, uh, got a law degree from Southern Methodist University. He started uh, in the legal area for USADA, as it's called, and worked his way up to uh, <coughs> CEO. USADA investigates Olympic athletes on potential drug violations. They also uh, give outreach, uh, educational information to young people, and they fund research in terms of sports and uh, issues related to it. So he's leading one of the most influential organizations, and it's gonna be terrific to have him here today. Now, you know a little bit about him, I think you'd like to know a little about our EPU, so let's start here and everybody give a couple of sentences, introduce yourself. Okay, hi, um, I'm Kate Kaysen, I'm a junior uh, PR and political science school major. Um, really thankful to be here, thank you so much for coming to talk to us. Um, yeah, I'm just really interested in what you have to say. That's good, yeah. that's good. Um, I'm Justine, I'm a junior, I'm an advertising major, and I am really pleased to have this opportunity to um, I'm Claudia Plazas. I'm double majoring in journalism and sociology and minoring in French. Wow. Very happy to be here. Yeah, good. Good to see you. Um, hi, I'm Paula. Um, I'm a junior major in information science going into journalism. And yeah, same as everyone else. Excited. <laughs> <laughs> hi, I'm Kevin Ermacher. I'm a journalism and political science double major um, from Rochester, New York. And uh, thank you for coming to speak with us. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate it. I'm Kelsey Sipis. I'm a senior reporting major. Um, I'm Emily Freeman, and I'm a senior business journalism major with the reporting sequence. I'm Emma. Um, I'm a graphic design and poli sci major, and I'm especially excited to hear anything about swimming because I saw you did a little bit with mm -hmm. USA Swimming because mm -hmm. I was a swimmer. Well, so. Great. Um, I'm Claire Williams. I'm a sophomore history and journalism major reporting, and I'm really excited to hear what you have to say. That's great. Well, thanks. So, do you need me to sit, or wherever <laughs> I'm comfortable is all right? Well, it's, it's obviously a, a thrill um, for me to be here, and congratulations to you guys um, for being, I guess, you know, the top of your class to a certain extent to be invited um, to this this presentation. Hopefully, by the end of it, you won't say, "Man, I must be on the other the, the wrong dean's <laughs> list," right? Uh, probably the, the dean's list I was on when I was in school here. But you know, I was just telling um, Speed how impressed. I am every time I come back to, to the university, you know, not only the growth and, and the buildings and the beauty of, of Chapel Hill, because um, it certainly is a, a special place for me. You know, I met my wife here, graduated with a philosophy degree, which I'm not sure um, got me into teaching, first of all, um, but, but uh, and then ultimately law school from there. But it's just it's such a wonderful place, and it's great to see um, students of your caliber, and, and, and while this is a, a small group, um, you know, the students uh, that we've seen in John's classes today are just continue to, it's remarkable how smart and attentive and critical and fun and engaging they are, and it's just, it's just a thrill as an alum um, to see the school doing so well from, from a student standpoint. So again, I congratulate you all, and it's really an honor and a, a privilege for me to be here. I certainly, um, as a struggling philosophy major, never would have thought um, I would one day be over at the J School doing um, a topic like this with a group of students as, as you know, excellent as you all. So thank you, and, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. You know, let me just give a, uh, given the, the title's leadership, kind of my background on leadership and, and some traits that I've seen over the years um, and sort of what my background um, is rooted in when it comes time to running a corporation. And you know, we do deal with high profile communications areas from time to time, education from time to time. So I'm happy you know, in the, the Q&A session to talk more about things that might be you know, on the front of your mind and can help, help you as you, you know, look for jobs and go out into the, into the workforce. Um, you know, at the end of the day, good or bad, my philosophy on leadership comes from what I learned playing sports. And I think that's one reason why I'm so passionate about what I do now, because we're an entity at USADA, as John said, um, whose, whose job it is, our, our mission is to protect 
the values of what sport is supposed to teach kids and sports fans, you know, teamwork, um, sacrifice, dedication, having a goal that you're going to strive for. And I, and I think back as I, as I think about leadership and the lessons that I've learned in kind of creating a culture at USADA, doing the best I can, um, I, I go back to my baseball teams, uh, my junior year in high school and then my senior year in high school. And, and I was fortunate uh, to, put, to go to a school that had a tremendous athletic program. Um, and of course, as a young kid, loved every sport that was out there. Um, and, and that's where I sort of flourished. And the classroom was unfortunately um, secondary, but the, but the athletic fields was what I loved and what I knew. And, and through that, um, you know, I met my best friends, um, you know, because we would be in the trenches together and we would, you know, push each other, we'd, you know, cry at certain times, we'd fight at other times, but at the end of the day, you know, we were all, you know, aligned for a common goal. Um, so that, that's a, a trait that I carry to the business um, world where, look, you can, you can have disagreements um, in the workplace. And, and someone might want to do an advertising campaign this way where you want to do it that way. And what's critically important is you have that discussion and you respect one another. You have um, you know, a civil discussion about it. But at the end of the day, whatever is decided by whoever is ultimately making the decision, you all align with it and you support it. And, and our, I'll never forget our, our 88 uh, baseball team was, I think it was the best in the state that year in Florida. Very competitive um, you know, state baseball programs, but we got upset and we lost in the district um, or the regional finals before making it to the state championships. And, and we, we had a team of a bunch of individuals, quite frankly. We all thought we were the best on the field. We didn't, you know, we were a little jealous when the other player hit the home run and it wasn't us. You know, if someone made an error, it wasn't let's rally around them and support them. Let's blame them for causing runs to come in. And, and we rightfully lost. And it was a really hard sting, especially for the seniors that were on that team. Contrast that with the next year. We had a group of people, we didn't have, we had one superstar um, who ended up being the number one draft pick uh, in the 90 draft still plays Major League Baseball today. So we had one superstar, but we had a lot of sort of utility players around that one superstar. But I think back through that year and the superstar got hurt. You know, tore a, tore a ankle, I think it was. Uh, missed 10 or 12 games. And so what ended up happening, these utility players had to come together and really form a team that was going to have a goal um, and ultimately go and win a state championship, which we did. And, and looking back on it, I think the um, authentic discussions that we as a team had were really, really important. I think addressing some of the, um, you know, some of the things that arise in a culture was really important. We would have a, a pregame talk just amongst the team. No coaches, um, and, and, and we would come together before, you know, I'll never forget it, before the state championship game. And we'd have some players on the team that weren't starting. They were not gonna get in the game. They were maybe sophomores. And we'd just have the honest conversation that, look, um, you're not gonna play today, and that's okay. But we don't need you on the end of the bench, you know, mad or grumpy or, you know, detracting from the overall goal. And, and trust us, you're, gonna, you're just as important to this team in winning a state championship as anyone else. You might not be the guy hitting the home runs or pitching that day, but you're just as important because you can bring down what the rest of us are trying to do and the goals that we collectively have set for ourselves. And, and so I think a lot of those lessons to me were, were easily transferable to the workplace. You know, I think, um, I, I would just challenge you to find where you're comfortable. You know, not every leader, I think everyone's a leader, right, to some extent. I mean, my, we, we just got a new um, puppy, unfortunately, at my house. Um, and that dog follows my five-year-old son around everywhere he goes. My five-year-old is leading this puppy, <laughs> right? I mean, my kids, you know, hopefully will follow some leadership from their mom and from me. Um, you know around school, around your workplace, whatever capacity you are going to be a leader. It might not be running a company, but maybe it would be running a company. I never, quite frankly, in my wildest imagination thought I would be running a 
14 million dollar company with 40 full-time employees and their families and 65 part-time employees that is on the front page of the New York Times from time to time. Never in my wildest imagination. So it was sort of learning lessons that were appropriate for me. And then as I worked my way through my professional career, knowing who I was and relying on who I was. And, and being, you know, from my end, for me, it's, it's finding a passion about what I want to do. And I, I love sport for the reasons I told you sport. And so whether it was practicing law or doing what I'm now doing, I wanted to somehow help preserve um, the good traits that, 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 that sport gave to me that I think can give to a lot of kids, you know, particularly those of us who didn't excel early in the classroom. Um, so, it, so it's really finding, for me, that's finding your passion and then being willing to commit to your passion. It's not, it's not about money. It's not about celebrity. It's not about fame. It's, it, it really should be about you day in and day out really looking forward to going to work and, and hopefully, you know, when the long work day is over, and it might be a 24-hour work day, you really look forward to going home. And, and you have a nice balance, um, you know, in all aspects of your life. Because that truly, to me, um, from what I've experienced, is, is really the only way to be a, a successful leader in whatever capacity that you're ultimately going to be leading, whether it's your own kids, whether it's a puppy around the house, or, you know, a, a corporation, a $14, 15000000 million corporation. Um, so let me st stop there, because I know I'll, this should be a Q&A from you guys. Um, I did want to give you a little background just on you know, lessons of life that have transferred into sport that I've found important. Um, and, and certainly there's no magic number. I think you have to find, if, if you take away anything, you find what you, how you're going to lead. Who, and, and I think it's a self-assessment of who you are and, and what are your values and what are your traits, strengths, weaknesses, and, and be true to yourself as you go through that. Because people, people in this day and age, you know, we call it the posers. You can, people can see through posers. And if you're a, a leader that's a poser, um, it, you're gonna ultimately have problems at some point. Maybe not initially, but at some point you're not gonna be as successful as you otherwise could be successful. So with that, let me stop talking and, and hopefully answer some questions from you guys. All right, you're jumping at the bed. I see it. You, me? yeah. Okay, yeah. And, and tell me your tell me your name again. Um, I'm Paula. Paula. Um, I was wondering. You have a very specific background of law, and so you went from being the legal department to being the CEO of the whole company, which is you know a, a diverse amount of um, just fields and things that people are doing. So how did you, I guess, deal with the fact that you had this one specification and suddenly you were in charge of seeing the overall vision for an entire yeah, company? Yeah, yeah. No, good, great, really good question. You know, I think it was our startup. The, we were a startup. In late 2000, we got the job from the USOC that used to internally run their own anti-doping program. And so, and, and the firm that I joined in May of 2000, um, you know, there were two employees, the CEO and his assistant, um, so we, I literally was writing as an outside lawyer, writing thank you notes on behalf of the CEO. So a lot of it, honestly, was timing. Um, that I got in on the ground floor and I saw the entity build and the CEO and I, you know, really by happenstance, um, hit it off and he trusted me over time to do, you know, everything from writing a thank you note to helping him decide and give advice whether or not we should you know, go forward on the Balco cases and bring a case against Marion Jones, for example. Um, so I think, I think the experience is really critical. Um, you know, there, there's certainly, and one point I should have made during the, the leadership points that I made is, you know, there's the academic side of it, which is critically, critically important. And I'm frankly jealous that you all are where you're at, having, you know, a journalism degree, whatever, you know, discipline within that it is, because you'll, you may filter to, to a, uh, uh, um, I think that's my phone, sorry. You may filter through a, uh, an industry that you actually use what you learned. Um, not that I don't use what I learned over at the philosophy um, department, you know, the critical thinking, the logic, deduction, writing was all critically important, but um, I, never, I never got um, sort of the, the principles of management or 
you know, the principles of human relations. Those, those for me came through experiences. Um, so I think while the academics is critically important and you're, I think, fortunate to be in the position you're in, um, if that's the industry you ultimately go into, don't underestimate the experience um, because you can, you can gain if you're, uh, I think, being self-aware, willing to learn, and, and you do learn. You know, a lot of people make the same mistakes over and over and over. Um, I, I hope that it, I'm going to make mistakes. And I, I tell our employees, I mean, one of our core values is responsibility. And under it, we say, take risks. Because if in our world, given that athletes that want to cheat with drugs are always trying to stay one step ahead of drug testing, which if you have the resources and the sophistication, you can do, which is why you hear things like Marion Jones passed 120 drug tests and still cheated, um, unfortunately. So what, what I push our staff to do is, look, we have to stay relevant. We can't get comfortable um, in the world that we live because our ath the, the cheating athletes are not staying, you know, their behavior changes as we develop. And it would be totally unfair to the victims of doping if we stayed the same and didn't keep up with those that are trying to, to cheat. And it's really those victims, we talked about it earlier this morning, it's really those victims of cheating that we're here for. You know, the clean athlete who loses his or her opportunity um, to, to win because someone else is cheating. And so we've got an obligation to that group of people to support them and do everything possible. So I say stay relevant um, and, and, and don't get comfortable where you're at. But, you know, tied back into the experiences, it's learning from your experiences and not being afraid, I think, to take some risks and learning from those risks and, and, and not making the same, you know, bad decision if it was or um, you know, giving you the confidence to make the other decisions. Hey. How do you feel about Lance Armstrong? <laughs> um, you knew the question was coming at some point. You know, I, quite honestly, for all athletes who are put in a, a culture, and I, and I think, you know, Lance as well as, um, you know, Tyler Hamilton, who's come out publicly, and Floyd Landis, who, have come out, who has come out publicly. You know, I, I feel for athletes who, are, who have to rise um, in their sport um, to, to, to cheat. And, if, and it's, a, it's an untenable decision, I think. And we've heard from a lot of athletes that were in that sport at that time who left the sport and retired. And to me, that's a tragedy. It shouldn't happen to any athlete. You know, where you have to use dangerous performance enhancing drugs to, to reach the highest levels, um, to me is just a, is just a real sad state. And, and I, have I have empathy for those athletes. Now, it doesn't mean they get a free pass and aren't held accountable, um, but I, I, that's what drives me, as I don't want, and that's what drives USADA. We don't want athletes to have to face that culture. Um, so I have empathy for, you know, a, a Lance Armstrong or a Marion Jones who were you know, part of a culture that existed and, and, and made the same decision a lot of people made at that time. And, and look, I, I take, we have to take partial responsibility for that, I think, um, as does the sport, as do sports fans. I mean, it's not about assessing the, the you know, you saw it as 10% responsible because its testing wasn't good enough. It's not about really that. It's hopefully looking forward to try to use you know, those tragic examples as ways to um, provide a better, more hopeful uh, future for a sport where, where athletes don't have to, to endanger their own lives in order to be the best and to win. Yep. Um, and I know that the um, USADA mostly focuses on professional athletes, um, but there was an article in the Huffington Post recently about how high school students who are trying to get in um, to college athletes they've been scouted and they need their test scores to reach a certain admission level and have been now using um, Adderall Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, to get their test scores to the level of their um, athletic performance. You know, I don't know how much you guys can regulate that um, or what, what is the stance yeah. on that? Well, it's totally, I think it's a fascinating discussion point, totally, you know, totally outside of anything that, that we do. Um, yeah, there's a book, The Cheating Culture, if, if you like that topic, you should read it. I think it's, um, how's it, Callahan, I think, wrote it. But anyway, it's a 
it's a, it's a book that came out a few years ago, and it, it profiled students and parents mostly in sort of the Northeast college prep scene where they were having their kids go in um, and be diagnosed with a, a ADHD for two reasons. One, they could get the drugs that they thought it would help. Um, but two, they then would have an untimed SAT. And gosh, even me in high school, if I had it untimed, I would have aced it, you know? And so you have kids, whether they have ADHD or not, um, got an untimed SAT. And so their SAT scores, and, and what eventually happened was enough parents did it where they weren't the outliers. You know, you're always gonna have outliers that try to break the rules and get away with it. Um, whatever industry you're in, sports or otherwise. But it, it was a fascinating tale of how the outliers then became the majority. And once the majority is out there doing it, there, there are a whole lot of victims whose kids don't have it, whose parents aren't willing, you know, they're playing by the rules. They're not willing to go get a fabricated prescription solely so their kid can have an untimed SAT. And when it comes time for college admissions, they don't know if you have an untimed SAT or not. They just see your final score. I, I guess in this book, and I think it was Princeton, I might be off on the facts, but one of the universities actually then had a box. Did you take it timed or untimed? And that started weeding out from an admission standpoint, which seemed like a fair and reasonable thing to do to help you know, the victims who didn't, weren't going to go fabricate a prescription for their kid who doesn't have the drug, you know, the disease, just so they can get an untimed SAT. Um, but then a lawsuit was filed against the university that that, you know, was unfair against those that actually do have untimed SAT. So, you know, there's a whole, the, the point, I guess, is the culture, the win at all cost culture, the hyper competitive culture, whether it's academics, um, you know, sports is where we live. You know, it's, it's, it's got parents doing crazy things with their high school, or with their young athletes. I mean, we talked earlier in the class, the percentage of, you know, out of the three million high school athletes in uh, five sports, I think it was basketball, baseball, men's, women's, football, soccer, men's, women's, that, you know, out of that roughly three million that ultimately make it to a professional level where they get paid, and that includes like, you know, the Durham Bulls where they're making, you know, a thousand bucks a month or whatever it is. Um, like point, if I remember this correctly, 0.004% out of that three million. I mean, the things we're doing to kids in sports with that percentage of making it to the elite level where you get any money is just, is just off the charts, I think. Um, so, but it's, you know, it goes back to this win at all costs culture that we all have to deal with on a daily basis. And, and make no mistake, I mean, there, we want to win, right? I mean, I didn't go out for the state championship team in, in 89 and not want to win. It's at what point do we as a community of people and a team or a society to say, well, we want to win, but we don't, we don't want to endanger our lives or we're not going to win by breaking the rules knowingly and intentionally. Um, so there's a, there's a uh, you know, the issue is right on the, the, the tip of the spear on, on, as a society, how do we deal with those issues in whatever industry that, that, that we're talking about. Other questions, yep. Thanks, so we go here and then we'll come back. Yep. Um, when you're talking about athletes doping, where does the pressure to do this come from? Is it the individual deciding to do it for themselves? Is it the coach? Yeah, I think, I, I think all, I think, I think there's a lot of self-pressure. You know, athletes are, you know, elite athletes especially are, are, are hyper competitive and they want to they win. Um, coaches certainly play a big role. I think teams can create cultures that, that, that put pressure on it. Um, parents, you know, we had a 14-year-old inline roller skater. Not a money sport, not a fan. Most of you probably didn't even know inline roller skating was a sport. Um, it's actually a Pan Am sport, not an Olympic sport, but it's played in the Pan Am games. And, and this kid was on uh, Corey Gahan. It's a sad, tragic story. He was on one of the most sophisticated um, doping programs that we've ever seen. And it was his dad and the coach that put him on it, injected him with human growth hormone, steroids, um, insulin, and 14 years old. And, and I think it was also the dad could walk around his office and brag, you know, that his son was the junior world champion in inline roller skating and just feed that sort of ego kick that you, you see with a lot of, uh, lot of parents and their kids. 
Yeah, Sports Illustrated did a, uh, a, a pretty good, accurate um, story on it. If you get a chance, Google Corey Gahan. It's G-A-H-A-N. You might, you might enjoy it. So I think it's all across. I think it's all across the board. And uh, do you know what it was in the Lance Armstrong case? If it was him or if it was a coach? You know, I think the I think the the culture that's created in various sports, I think, is you know, if you feel like you know what we hear from a lot of athletes, and take it out of you know the Armstrong case or any particular one, you know, if if you if you believe, and it maybe goes to the ADHD medication, if you believe everyone else is playing by the rules, then you're more inclined to play by the rules. But the inverse of that is even more so. If you believe everyone else is breaking the rules, then you're more inclined to break the rules. And, and I think, you know, uh, again, w whether cycling then, track and field, um, you know, in the, in the mid 2000s, um, that allowed a culture to exist where everyone believed everyone else was doing it, maybe rightly so, maybe not, but that culture took over and ultimately, you know, sort of anarchy and the rules happened. And the whole culture, you either, you either did it or you didn't compete. And, and unfortunately, that, that, uh, that culture existed. Yeah. How much does the fact that I care about athletes using drugs, either legal or illegal, outside competition? I'm actually making a reference to Michael Phelps. Yeah, good question. And we, we talked about that earlier today. Um, you know, if it's for us, it's it's a rules based. Um, if it's against the rules of competition, just like you know, the basketball and um, down in the Dean Dome is ten feet, right? I mean, it could be nine feet, it could be eight feet, but it's set at ten feet. So one team shouldn't have a basket at eight feet that gives them an unfair advantage when the other team has to shoot at a ten foot basket. So they're really the rules. Sport, you know, really at, at the heart of it is an agreement by competitors. To follow a set of agreed to rules. So for us, it's what is, what's the rule? Um, is it allowed in competition? Is it allowed out of competition? Marijuana, for example, um, is not prohibited in competition. So it's not against the rules to use marijuana outside of competition. And, and that's our position. That's what the world has agreed to. And so we're unlike, you know, maybe other um, industries you know, we, we, don't, we don't have to take, and we don't take positions on sort of recreational use that is not against the rules that, that we have to deal with and that we've agreed to. Yep. Um, my question goes back to leadership, and I've been hearing a lot about emotional intelligence, you know, I've yeah, heard this term, sure. and, you know, being able to enter a conversation and see and that stuff, and I read that it, it increases one of, the, so one of the only things that keeps increasing over time. And so I was wondering if you learned, have any lessons you've learned after becoming CEO, things that, I don't know, weren't apparent to you in the corporate <laughs> world yeah. and stuff. Yeah, yeah. The, um, the EQ, you know, the emotion uh, uh, quotient is, is um, no, I, and I think, I think reading, I mean, good for you for l even knowing that, but reading those, again, sort of academics and hearing different philosophies, you know, I, I get, um, you know, I think, I think I have to learn from a management and substantively um, as much as I can every, every day. I mean, I, you know, usually try to read two or three papers a day, get the Harvard Business Review monthly, but also the dailies. And so I'll see a highlight on, you know, how to, how to create a uh, team culture and, and read the highlights. So I, I think you always, I mean, I think you, you always have to keep learning, and, I, and I, it, to me it comes back to the student, I mean the athletes, staying relevant. And if I, in my position, if I let down my guard, whether it's management, philosophy, or learning, um, that then affects my culture at the office negatively, I'm letting our athletes down. You know, if, if we're not continuing to just push forward as, as fast and as quick as we can, um, you know, since becoming CEO, I think the, um, you know, I, how you communicate, I think, is really important. Um, I think, you know, my, my boss, when I took over, <laughs> he gave me really two pieces of advice that, to this day, maybe are the best two that I got. First one was, given the job, and this doesn't apply to many other industries, I don't think, although maybe it should, um, you can't need the job. 
and well, you can't need the job. What does that really mean? Well, what he meant was you're going to make decisions that are going to be really, really unpopular, right? I mean, the media is going to go crazy. Your stakeholders are going to go crazy. So you can't need it because you're going to have to make tough decisions because it's the right thing to do. Um, the second thing he said was you want to be the team that you surround yourself with at the table sitting around the conference room, you want to be the dumbest one at the table. Um, obviously, that's not too hard for me to do. <laughs> but the point is, hire a great team. And I think, you know, a lawyer, usually a private lawyer, particularly in, you know, the practice I was in prior, your, your, your job is to, you know, get your files, shut the door, and produce a lot of stuff, you know, whether it's Discovery, you know, interrogatories, requests for admissions, prepare for trial, depositions. So you're, you're, a, you're a free agent to a certain extent. You work by yourself. Every once in a while you bring a team together if it's a big project. Um, so certainly having to learn, I can't just shut my door and do my work and produce. Like I got accustomed to producing a lot of things, letters and, you know, external communications. But as a CEO, you, your job is to create a culture. And, and uh, when I first took over the job, I thought I would spend 50% of my time externally, you know, interacting on the Hill where we spend time with our sport partners, with pro leagues, um, and 50% of my time internally. But what I realized was I actually needed 100% of my time outside, but also needed 100% of my time inside. So you gotta find those balances that, that really work for you. And, and then stretching where you're comfortable. Um, you know, I, I think stretching where you're comfortable. I had no financial background really, and, and had to you know, put myself into financial accounting classes and seminars, not classes, but seminars, um, so that I could know the numbers as good as, as anyone on our staff. Obviously relying on our CFO to to, to, to handle things, but, but you know, you, gotta, you kinda have to be a jack of all trades. And so, you know, from my accounting class here at Carolina, which I barely passed, and hopefully they won't look back at the transcripts. Um, <laughs> you, you know, just so, so knowing, identifying where you're not, where your vulnerabilities are, and then building them up as much as you possibly can, I think is a, is a really good lesson. I, I, and this, this is not necessarily a good thing, but I think it's a trend that I've seen in some of the management books, um, you know, the fear of failure is a, is a big motivator and, and the uncertainty. I mean, I'm, I, I try not to ever get comfortable because once I feel like once I'm, I get comfortable as a person and as a leader, then I'm not, I'm not ready, you know? And, and there's, there's some downside to that, quite honestly. There is a lot of downside to it, I think. But for me, it, it, it works, at least as it works. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Asked a question. Oh, okay. Okay, thanks. Um, I want to relate uh, what you do to something that's been going on on campus, um, especially covering the football scandal. Yeah. I think that I'd like to get a sense from you is uh, what drives you to kind of tell people things they don't want to hear? Because I know um, working for the paper, it's uh, a lot of the times it's like, why are you guys covering this? Um, you know, it's, it's hard to tell people that their heroes were cheating. Yeah. Um, what, what drives you to do that, and how do you kind of? Um, you know, we just go to the evidence, and uh, look, it's 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 absolutely bittersweet when we get evidence that you know Marion Jones or Lance Armstrong or anyone else has cheated sport. I mean, it's it's just a, it it, it means in part we failed because we couldn't convince them with our educational and our preventative measures not to do it, and we much would have preferred them to come to us and say, look, you're letting me down because all these other people are cheating, and now I have to cheat in order to be successful, you know, we're not, we're not, we're not doing our job. We failed in that sense. So, it, so, it's, so it's really hard and it's really tough. Um, I think you just have to pull out any of the personal aspects of it. Um, I, I sometimes, when I use the word leadership, I combine it with ethical leadership. Um, you know, it's not personal. It's a, it's a duty, it's a mission, it's something bigger than yourself. You know, hopefully you have a, a criteria of principles that you can go back to and rely on. And you know, the Plato's Republic will talk about the, those that go towards the light and the ridicule and the laughing and you know, the, the attacks that they'll get. But, but actually, those that go towards the light and the Republic are the enlightened ones. 
because it's not personal. They're not being, you know, making uh, decisions on something other than the principles that they had set forth for themselves. So I think you just have to come back to that. You know, it, it can take a lot out of you, um, and rarely does it give much back, quite honestly. But at the end of the day, you, you, if, if you're driven to do the right thing, even when it's tough, um, you know, I, I think we're, to some extent, the society's become, you know, everyone reacts not on principle or not on a criteria of ethics, but on public opinion polls or blogs in this, from this newspaper or comments on this website or comments in this forum. And, and while that's really important and we pay attention to it, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't alter ultimately the principles that we fall back on and the decisions that we make. But, but you have to have thick skin from time to time. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, yeah. So obviously you all faced a lot of criticism recently. Um, and I just wondered like, as a leader, how do you get your people through that? When there's this yeah. so much like out wide, yeah. outer criticism. No, I think, the, I, think, I think being authentic, I think I mentioned that. Um, you know, to me with, with the, the generation that we have um, who was brought up on, I mean, I made the joke at lunch today, it, when I was at Carolina, there was no email, there was no, there was a computer lab where everybody had to go, and it was brand new, it had Apple IIEs in it, to which they said, what's an Apple IIe? Um, so I think, I think the real human interaction is critically important. Um, you know, it's easy to send a text, it's easy to do an email, rarely do you have phone calls anymore that last more than a couple minutes. Um, but what we do is we bring our staff together and we try to, you know, we try to give information. And, you know, the lawyers will tell you, and I'll just use an example that's not sort of case related, but I mean, a good example is when we have to, unfortunately, have had to let employees go. Um, again, it's never anything you like and you don't want to have to do it. But, you know, after you set an expectation and you have a review process and if you've got one team member not working in the same direction, um, and they've been given a fair chance to, to improve and, 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 and figure it out and, and they just don't, you know, maybe personal things or whatever's going on, you, you have to be willing to make that decision. And that's the hardest thing I ever had to do as the general counsel was, you know, terminate an employee. I just, I care about people and it just, it just is not fun when you have to do that, knowing what's at stake. Um, but what we do, and this is contrary to the advice I used to give when I was the lawyer, and certainly contrary to most lawyers advice out there if we ever have that situation um, and we've had it a couple times and since I've been CEO over the last five years we bring everyone together and and we don't go into details we don't talk about the facts but we just say look guys we all know um, that we have expectations and you all know the fairness of the process and before we let an employee go um, we you know, I identify it and we address it. And if they continue to let the team down, we have no other choice. And just so you know, we've had to, you know, ask so-and-so um, not to work here anymore. And, and you know, it's, it's hard with a small shop because you have friendships, but what we found is that's an, that's an authentic, open way. You know, what most companies would do would send an email saying, so-and-so no longer works here. And then what happens, and we've seen it at, at our shop before um, we started doing the open communication, what would they do? You know, what happened? And, and back to my high school baseball team, when you had the guy at the end of the bench, you know, who wasn't going to play, he could bring down that whole team. And so we've said, let's, let's flip it. Yeah, lawyers, I hear you, and, and I appreciate the risks that are there. But you know what? We're not going to overly protect the one bad apple. We're going to protect the force that's still going forward. And so that open, honest communication, again, being judicious and not getting into detail and you know, embarrassing people and not, certainly not defaming people, but just high level, you got, just reminding people, you know our process, you know we're fair, you know we want all of you to be you know, the CEO of USADA or some other sport entity, but you, you have responsibilities. And, and when we don't you know, hold each other accountable to those responsibilities, we have to, take, we have to make decisions. And, and that's just an, uh, one example of having to deal with tough situations and articulating, communicating. The, the in-person stuff to me is, is key. Because you, you know, the text, you just can't get the emotion, you can't get the personal eye contact, and 
it's easy to hide behind texts. And I, and I, and I, and I say it um, at staff meetings all the time, you know, we have to, we have to interact in person with our stakeholders, you know, because then it's, it's harder for um, communication to be effective when you're doing it through a, a device. Although it's a lot easier, no question about it. Yeah. Um, obviously, you know, um, our Chancellor of the Board has stepped down in recent um, weeks, and he is like our leader, I would say, um, of the university system. And it has kind of divided our campus in terms of people who have backed him and people who have, um, you know, shown that they're, um, they would like him to leave. And just as, you know, someone who is in an organization, how can our campus kind of reunite again and try and get through this process? I mean, I know that the- Wow, yeah, that's a tough question. Yeah, yeah. But I, I just- No, like, yeah, look, I, and even as, a, as a, uh, an alum who tries to stay close to the university, seeing, seeing the ESPN headline with top people resigning, you know, whether it's a football coach or executive vice president is disheartening. Yeah, and it, it's been a tough couple of years. And it raises a lot of questions. No, look, I think, you, you know, I, I, I couldn't even pretend to know what's best for the university because I just don't know the facts. I, I just go back to what I said, really said previously. I mean, you have to act on the principles. So while it's easy to rationalize and justify your way around those principles, you, you have to, at the end of the day, actions speak louder than words. And I really believe you have to, you have to act on them in a, in a fair and, and reasonable way. Now, does that mean, you know, firing, you know, you know, coaches at, you know, times or not? I, again, uh, you'd have to look at the facts and, and make those decisions on, well, what are the principles? What do we want out of this program? Um, certainly it's a difficult situation, you know, and I, obviously anybody that cares about this university hopes that it, it gets resolved. You know, that said, um, I do know um, Chancellor Thorpe a little bit. I've met him several times. Um, you know, he's, he's sent me a couple emails at times when he knew I was in the firing line and I, I found them very, um, you know, I really appreciated them, quite honestly, quite honestly. So, you know, personally, I, I hope the best for him and his family. Yeah, um, I was wondering what your opinion is of uh, athletes being allowed to return to the sport after they've uh, been caught cheating, uh, specifically thinking of Justin Gatlin. Yeah, being back at yeah you know, we are, as I said earlier, we, we really empathize with athletes and their decisions, and we know it's not easy. We still have to be held accountable, obviously, because that's fair and right, and that's the rules, and that's what clean athletes who don't succumb expect. Um, but once, you know, once they've paid the the consequence, serve their time, uh, you know, so to speak. You know, I think I think they can be really powerful, um, you know, allies. I mean, one example we spoke about this morning, um, well, actually at lunch, was Antonio Pettigrew, and I don't know if you know that name, but he was um, someone in Balco who succumbed and and cheated. Um, when confronted, he acknowledged it all. Um, get, you know, voluntarily returned his medals. Didn't force us to spent a bunch of time and money proving the truth because he knew what the truth was. And, and he you know, sent us his medals. He actually um, ended up getting hired here at, at UNC as an assistant track coach. We actually called um, you know, the athletic director at the time and, and said, look, he's got a powerful story and could be you know, a, a great inspiration. And within an educational environment, I mean, if we can't forgive people and allow them to right their wrongs, you know, what are we, what are we doing? And unfortunately, uh, he got hired. Um, in fact, one of the um, students earlier today, I guess he spoke to their, one of the conditions, I think, of him being rehired was he had to give a, um, he spoke and talked about his experiences, why he made the decisions he did, why when he was confronted he did the right thing and, and acknowledged it um, to the, what was it, the Freshman Academy, which is, I think, all the freshman at, uh, scholarship athletes come together and they, you know, give them information. And, and so I was thrilled to hear, you know, his story actually ended up in a, in a tragic story and he ended up um, passing away a, a couple years ago. But I think it's a good example of where we come out is, you know, nobody's perfect, man. But, you know, we're all humans. And, and you, can, you can understand from, um, you know, an elite competitive athlete, they're not ax murderers when they cheat. 
they just they're trying to they're trying to win and who can fault anybody for trying to win yeah um, do you make this like a special exception for minors, like the, in case of the 14-year-old in like rollerblader whose parent, like whose father and his coach, forced him to take these drugs? Like, do you make a special yeah. exception for doing that? You, you know, there, the intent is a, a critical element to not necessarily to the offense, but to the um, to the length of sanction. And in his case, what we our our special consideration um, when he returned from competition, we had as part of the resolution, um, we got him medical um, counseling um, to ensure that none of the drugs did you know, permanent or long-lasting damage to his body. So there's this notion of, certainly of redemption after your time, but also um, trying to rehabilitate. While the, you know, the research on sort of the addictive nature of steroids and EPO and the other drugs is not like it is on cocaine or alcohol or some of the recreational drugs. Um, and we rarely see situations where, you know, athletes have addictions in that sense. Um, although, you know, certainly the, the money and the fame and um, some of the sort of uh, traits that, you know, addicts have uh, arguably could, could carry over. Just the science and the research is not there with respect to the performance enhancing drugs. But where we have an obvious situation like, like him, we try to um, where we have flexibility, try to work work through that in the best of their interest. Yep. What has your opinion been on the mainstream media's coverage of doping culture and of your organization? Yeah. Um, you know, I, it's this. I think it's the same. I think Balco is a, a good example of the wave that we see um, when there's a high-profile case. Um, although maybe maybe the apathy, you know, you hear it, steroid for fatigue. Is, is setting in in a, in a bigger way. And, and that's really a, a problem for us because it's still a live issue to athletes and it shouldn't be, you know, sort of how the press reports it or um, politicians view it. Because at the end of the day, the athletes, it, you know, it's, it, they're, they're new athletes, they're competing. And, and if they get robbed, you know, they're just as much of a victim as someone back in, you know, baseball in the late 90s. So it's still just as important, even though we're all sort of becoming immune to the, to the shock value of it, I guess. You know, from USADA's standpoint, I mean, unfortunately, we got cast early by um, defense counsel. Actually, Marion Jones, and I, maybe Carolina should take some credit uh, for the communications plan that high-profile athletes who have been caught doping, how they respond. And I think play one out of their playbook, and, and Marion, her team created it, quite honestly, and you saw Barry Bonds use it, you saw Clemens use it, you've seen others use it, um, you know, it's just, is to, is to deny. And, and you probably do uh, an assessment of, do I have any criminal exposure? And I don't want to do anything that is going to create additional criminal exposure. So, you know, you would never show up in a proceeding and testify. Um, including one of our proceedings, um, and, and lie under oath, because that may create additional criminal exposure for you, because you don't want to go to jail um, over something you did in sport that really is a sport issue, not a, necessarily a, a crime, at least in this country. Um, so, so you assess that, and once you get that assessment, you, you, you know, I think you deny, if that's the path you want to go, hopefully, and actually, I, I'd encourage you, ESPN did a really good piece um, sort of documenting what happened when Marion decided to, to deny, lie, and then attack versus Kelly White, who very similar, involved with the same doping conspiracy. She made the decision, like Antonio Pettigrew, to acknowledge it and just, you know, seek redemption and move forward and admit their mistakes. And to see, you know, fast forward from that point in 03 to where they were five years ago, you know, one spent six months in jail and was a convicted felon. You know, the other went and got a uh, graduate degree in marketing, an MBA with a marketing specialty, and is working for a, you know, a private company making a, a good salary and is not a felon and can vote in this year's election. Um, so, uh, so I think you have to, you know, think through if you're in, in those positions. Um, and so it's, so I guess going back to what they do and what Marion's team perfected, you know, they, they, um, 
they, they make a decision, you know, control your criminal liability, make a decision if you're going to accept responsibility or not, and if not, um, then you go down the path that she did, which is, you know, go on the offensive and turn the tables and, and turn it into, you know, the secret kangaroo court. That, that was her term. I mean, you've heard that a lot recently. The vendettas um, term you've heard a lot. That was what she used. Um, go, to, go to the Hill. You know, back, back in, in the time we had um, a GAO investigation that was opened up against us in 04 um, by Conyers, um, who you may have seen similarly introduce some, some legislation here unbeknownst to us, um, just, you know, sort of out of the blue. So the model's there, and you, and you see it over and over. And, and so our job, one, we've lived through it, so it's deja vu to a certain extent. So we, you know, we know what to expect. We anticipate um, it happening. We don't necessarily like it, but you know, again, it's not personal for us. We just do our job. Um, we have to bide our time. And, and while it's tempting sometimes to want to get in the weeds and you know, argue point for point and try the ca case in the press and all that sort of stuff, and, and while we are people at USADA, we're not just an entity, we're not a government agency, we're you know, real life human beings. Um, you know, they don't carry pitchforks or have red devil ears, you know. Um, what, what we do is we just bide our time and, and wait until the process allows for the truth and the accurate facts to be presented. And then when it does, we, you know, we present it and we don't try to manipulate it because we don't need to. We just can rest on what the truth is and we then let, you know, those who are willing to listen to the truth or view the truth sort through it and, and come to their own conclusions. We know um, what the evidence is in those cases and any case we deal with, um, and we're going we're gonna to do what's um, appropriate and right under our mission based on what the evidence, no other reason, no other reason. So it's, it's actually, at the end of the day, um, when you have something that's clear cut, it's, it's, it's actually pretty, pretty easy decisions. Yep. Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Um I was going to ask about how you treat athletes who um, have made a mistake versus athletes who like didn't know that they're taking a drug. I'm looking specifically at Hope Solo yeah. um, earlier in the summer, and I know that uh, you guys said that you know she cooperated fully and that she said it was a mistake. Does cooperating with you guys like coming in saying like yes I didn't know does that help a lot? Does that yeah, and yeah, that? and you know, we, we obviously have to, I mean, it, you know, you, you, every athlete, I guess, to some extent would say that, you know, um, you know, if they don't deny it, they, they may try to, um, you know, minimize, let's say. So, so our job is, you know, we have, to, we have to challenge that, you know, because that's, again, we can't let excuses, you know, what's the quote from one of the cases, the, the denial is the common currency of the guilty and the innocent, unfortunately. Um, so what we have to do is, is see the proof, see the evidence. And so when we said, you know, in, in Hope Solo's case, and it was, a, you know, it, was a, it was an inadvertent situation, she said that, but we then also backed it up and, and, and had to get comfortable that the evidence also proved that it was inadvertent. So what did we do? Well, we looked at the levels in her sample and was it consistent with the story that she said? Did she write the medication that she claimed was the source on her doping control official record? Did she have a proper prescription for that uh, medication? So we interview the doctor. We get the medical records. We get the test results. And we objectively, to the extent that we can, um, corroborate um, her story. You know, I, I say around the office, too, we're, we're going we're gonna to push to exonerate the innocent just as hard as we would push to, you know, show that someone doped. Because, you know, we're not doing our job unless we do that. Um, so I think that's a, a great example of where, you know, we put a lot of time and resources into, um, you know, proving the, the truth and, and ultimately it um, benefited her and, and, and worked out well. And, and from our perspective, it was the, the outcome that should have happened under the rules. And it would have been a real tragedy quite frankly, if in her case, we jumped to two years and that's it. That would have been a real disservice to her. And, and frankly, to all you know, athletes who are doing their best to play by the rules.
Yeah, Emma? Uh, swimming. No. I thought you were going to ask about swimming. Well, yeah, uh, this kind of like, <laughs> real, I don't know. I don't have a specific question. I just saw um, in the little bio they sent us that you had worked with you at Swimming. But I'm curious, how does an investigation start? Do you, because obviously most of your athletes, they don't have, there's no proof immediately that they're doping. So is it just people that are really successful and you investigate and then or is it someone is there a rumor going around or does someone have to come to you and yeah so absent a absent a positive test yeah which obviously you would immediately have yeah. to look into um and, and we review analytical results um there's what's called a passport program you may have read about it but it it basically takes various test results that aren't they're not designed to be positive or not they're designed to basically be a snapshot of you know, your hematocrit, for example, over time. So the percentage of red blood cells. And, you know, most people, if you're not doping, um, you know, uh, well-fit, you know, women 40 to 41. Well-fit men maybe 42 to 44. But if you see these big spikes, you know, from, you know, 39 to 49, for example, in a female, that would send a very, you know, big red flag and so we have that program that most anti-doping agencies like us have. So that would be an area that we might have lab results that would, you know, indicate. Most is you know, like yeah, we've got, so, we've got, you know, we do, we do our testing program accounts for that, and we have software that accounts for that. So that's that's one avenue. Another avenue is we have a, a tip line. It's called the Play Clean line, where you know we'll get. You can even give it anonymously. Uh, obviously, we have a very robust. Um, legal process internally, you know, can't be a comp one competitor who just lost go on and complaining about someone and then we open a file. But it, it's all based on, you know, information that we receive where we can confirm it, corroborate it, then we may open up a file. But no, we don't sit around and, you know, say, hey, this person just won this or this person just won that and we're going to investigate. Um, it's information that's brought to us. Um, through those various avenues that we then sort through and ensure, you know, the veracity of it, if that's the issue or that it cooperates. And, and maybe it's we do testing based on it. In Balco, for example, we got the syringe sent to us and we did some research to develop a test for what was in the syringe. And then we implemented the test and then we had five positive tests. So, you know, we have a very um, tightly controlled and run internal legal process where the lawyers will evaluate the information, the intelligence that we receive, and then determine, you know, which avenue does this does this carry down? Okay. And then I don't know. Um, during the Olympics, this is in I guess China, so you wouldn't have any. But the little the sixteen year old who like came she, in her last lap, she went faster than any of Michael Phelps. Yeah. Like. I don't know, were there any people talking about it? Yeah, I mean, there was definitely some, some people talking about it. You know, I think, what, I think what's really unfair, and I said this earlier today in the class, I think what's really unfair is when, you know, you see a, a great accomplishment, um, whether it's a swimming victory or anything else, um, and, you, and, and the media, to a certain extent, or sports fans immediately goes to, well, they had to be doing something. You know, that seems pretty impossible. It, look, I, I understand why it happens. I just think it's unfair. Yeah. I think, you know, to me, we're letting down our athletes um, if we can't give them a stamp of, you know, a surety or cleanliness. And, and that motivates our staff and, and us on a daily basis. I mean, I, I think it's a tragedy when someone's accused and there's no proof other than a, a decent performance, you know, and it really, to me, detracts from, you um, you know, it's a, it's a, I, I think at the end of the day, it's a compliment that we're not as good as we should be. And, and I, you know, I use that as sort of that fear of failure that should motivate us, you know, to, to be better and, and give athletes the opportunity when they win that people can know for sure that they've done it the right way and it's a, it's a true authentic performance. Yeah, John. One more question. <laughs> yep. Uh, I was wondering how much politics and dealing with government uh, impacts uh, what you can do in your job. How much? Say, say one more time on yeah, my show. Sure talk about the GAO investigation. Um, how much does um, like dealing with Congress or uh, other political uh, things that you might have to uh, deal with? How much does that? Uh, 
how much do you have to deal with that on a daily yeah. basis? Yeah. Yes. Well, you know, outside of anything, you know, extraordinary, I guess, um, you know, we get, we get um, not quite two thirds of our money through a grant. Um, we have an authorization. Um, so, you know, we have to ensure people understand who we are. We send an annual report to Congress, financial, independent financial audits. Um, so we're very open and transparent from that standpoint. And, you know, from time to time, we'll have questions. You know, from time to time, we'll uh, testify. Um, you know, I've testified uh, along with the NCAA and the USOC on, and the horse racing industry on sort of best practices. Did it on supplements. So there are various issues where they seek, you know, our expert consultation. Um, the HGH and, and football, um, you know, they brought uh, us in, our chief science officer, to give advice on, on that issue. And so, so really, that's sort of the normal run of the mill. You know, the Marion Jones uh, issue I mentioned earlier with the GAO investigation, um, that was sort of a high profile piece where, you know, uh, some politicians had more specific questions and called for the investigation. That's, that's very, very rare. Um, I think it's happened, you know, that one time, you've seen a little activity from the Hill over the Armstrong case. Um, but you know, our, our deal is we're open, we're transparent, we have nothing to hide. Um, what you read in the, in the media isn't always accurate. What you read on the blogs, unfortunately, is not always accurate. So if we're given a forum where we can go and prevent, present in a reasonable way information, we're happy to do that, whether it's on the Hill or anywhere else, quite honestly. Because you can't deflect the truth um, forever, you know, and if you have the truth, it, it, it eventually gets out there. Travis, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Hopefully it was good. You're not on the Dean's bad list, hopefully. Thank you, guys, for showing Thanks for your questions, guys. Yeah, it was great.